good morning we have so far seen a few issues about origin of music two types of major types of theories the relationship between nature and nurture the natural and the cultural we also saw a little bit about uh, we we discussed a little bit about the nature of music music as it is uh, as the medium which the medium of music every art has a certain medium uh, art has material and art has medium some distinction has to be made material is the physical material medium is the uh, is something which operates which which uh, uh, which is a kind of a code which operates between the sender and the receiver as an act of communication art is also an act of communication it may be something more than mere practical communication surely it is different kind of communication for example speaking to uh, each other is different from writing poems the art of writing poems the art of writing novels and short stories the art of writing epics there is some art involved in it rather than pure pragmatic communication we will talk about that but music uh, music has many functions at a certain level uh, music can be used simply to lift your spirits for example music which is played at parties at dinner parties for example uh, most of the people are not listening seriously to that music but music music can be used therapeutically the medical practitioners may use music for certain therapeutic purposes that is the functional part of music, but music has something within itself which I would not say entertains you, but it engages you certainly. I do not want to use the word entertainment today in the post globalization world there is no category for serious art art comes under entertainment. So, circus and dance will be at the same level, but I think dance is a more serious purpose than simply the circus. Pure entertainment industry is different from serious expression of music, dance and drama. There is also serious cinema. It used to be called experimental theatre, experimental films and so on. But even that word is no longer relevant. We all put it under entertainment, which is a totally inadequate concept, because entertainment consists of a large number of things which could be very non-serious classical music is a serious business something so we can call it serious art and classical dance definitely follows certain ways of expression which need not be equated with or need not be related to the entertainment purpose there is literature which is popular literature, there is literature which is more serious literature which may not appeal to a large number of audiences. So, people have talked about today, they have talked about something known as popular music, popular dance, popular cinema, popular drama as opposed to the more serious drama, dance, music, literature. 
they could be combined. For example, Shakespeare in his time was a very, very popular dramatist. Shakespeare rose to tremendous heights of fame, but Shakespeare is also respected for his serious approach to art. Shakespeare wrote the four great tragedies not simply to entertain people, but uh, maybe something like to give insight, psychological insight into the human mind, an insight into human culture, an in insight into human society, human relationships, human love, human jealousy, human um, uh, instinct to take revenge. Hamlet trying to take revenge of his father's death, his uncle has killed him. This is Shakespeare writing Hamlet, but Hamlet hesitates. So, it is a study in why people who, want, there are number of revenge tragedies written by Shakespeare's contemporaries. Shakespeare lived in the <coughs> latter part of 16th century and early part of 17th century. The last two decades of 16th and the first decade of 17th. These 30, 35 years, the early Shakespeare, middle Shakespeare, late Shakespeare and the four great tragedies, Hamlet I mentioned is a immensely intricate psychological study than revenge drama. Othello is a study in human jealousy. Othello's wife Desdemona, I mean she, uh, he is a Moor and she, she is a white person, they are married and there is a villain there who tries to create misunderstanding, he is very successful, he creates jealousy in the mind of Othello. Macbeth is also, there are many contemporary uh, plays of that kind, but Shakespeare is unique. He studies Macbeth and his wife's, Lady Macbeth's ambition. Somebody who wants to become the king by killing the king, regicide. And there were many plays showing regicide. The, the death of, the killing of a king, royal killings. But Shakespeare is unique in the sense that he creates an atmosphere of a very ominous atmosphere, extremely successfully, using supernatural elements like the witches and so on. And Macbeth is, feels trapped. So, it is again a very psychological, deep psychological study on the part of Shakespeare. And King Lear <coughs> with his three daughters, Lear is old, almost senile and wants to dispose of his kingdom, wants to give it away to his daughters. Now, he should have used his, his own senses, his own rationality to see how either equally divide them in uh, uh, among the three daughters or um, use his rationality, use, use some principle. The elder two sisters are too clever. What he does unfortunately for him and for everybody is to ask them, how much do you love me? And depending on that, this is an old foolish man asking the daughters to express, verbalize their own love. Now, he should have that kind of an understanding from the behavior patterns of the daughters. The elder two are married, the youngest one is about to be married. But he asks them and the first two, they praise him to the skies, 
Goneril and Regan, they praise him to the skies, but the third one says, I will love as much as I should love. You are my father. I can't simply say, you are the only person I love in my life. I am my I am going to get married. Now, she is frank, open and he gets very cruel. He becomes extremely uh, angry with her. So, this kind of relationship and the behavioral pattern and the thinking, the analytical approach of Shakespeare is very serious. Of course, there are flashy and entertaining elements for the Elizabethan audience. This was Elizabethan time. Elizabethan means the last 30, 40 years of England, Queen Elizabeth the first. From 1601, the new regime starts, James the first, a king comes to the throne, but till that time, Queen Elizabeth ruled England and these dramatists and that period is called Elizabethan period. Now, comparable to Shakespeare and Shakespeare's themes, there were many other playwrights, but nobody to match the art of serious art of Shakespeare. Shakespeare was popular and serious at the same time. Similarly, there are all kinds of musicians who could be popular as well as serious, but we do not have a category for serious art today. Okay? It comes purely under entertainment, which one has to quarrel with that kind of classification. If you see the advertisement, uh, adversary, advertisements of all kinds of music will come under entertainment, which is a which is a concept one should explore further in the context of art. What is entertainment? Is art entertaining? Does art disturb you? If it disturbs you, how does it entertain you at the same time? These are questions. We will take them up, but in the context of music, music has maintained a certain relationship with culture. And if you see, we have, we have uh, seen this on the slides. Please look at the slides. We have the proto-historical period in Indian history. BC 1500 to 500 is called the period dominated by an ideology called Brahminism. This is the uh, so called Aryan invasion, composition of Rigveda 1200 to 900 around that time BC, then the war depicted in the Mahabharata around 900 BC. Mahabharata was written later, but the war which was depicted in Mahabharata has taken place around that time. Then 900 to 500 BC, the later Vedas, that is apart from the Rig Veda, there is Yajur Veda, Sama Veda and finally Atharva Veda. They were sequentially composed. In the sense, the fir first came the Rig Veda then the other three Vedas. In fact, I told you last time, initially there were only three Vedas, the Atharva Veda, which contains uh, the Shakta Panthiya material, Shakta, the, 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 the goddess Shakti and the entire, uh, the entire tradition of magic black magic, including black magic, belongs to the Atharva Veda. Of course, magic and other things, they also involve 
problems of pollution, problems of health. So, Ayurveda has roots in Atharva Veda, okay, the health related issues. But the positive aspects of human life, the prayers to gods and goddesses in Rigveda, the interpretation of that in Yajurveda and Sam, the ritualistic interpretation and uh, artistic interpretation in Samaveda. So, there are uh, things like this in uh, in the Vedic tradition, the later Vedas that is Veda Samhitas, the text of Vedas and then the commentary on Vedas which are called Upanishadas, Brahmanas, uh, Aranyakas, they are the commentary. The origin of development of Sanskrit language can be traced in this period, which is called the Vedic Sanskrit. Then, while Sanskrit was being developed, we find the existence of Prakrit languages. The distinction between Vedic or Sanskrit and Prakrit has to be noted because it is something to do with the artistic traditions also. The Sanskritic tradition has something to do with the refinement of a culture. Prakrit is the natural folk culture, the, na the languages spoken by ordinary people, the Prakruts, Pali and Ardhamagadi. And as a reaction against Sanskrit, as well as the Brahminical culture, as well as the Vedas, two traditions emerged in India, two major traditions emerged, one is called Buddhism, the other is called Jainism. They are complete reactions, they reject Vedic knowledge right? and they were accepted, particularly Buddhism was accepted by some of the kings of India. So, it became official religion, Ashoka. So, these were the traditions, philosophical traditions and traditions of viewing human life and they propagated their messages in Prakrits. The Buddhists chose to talk in Pali, which is a Prakrit. And these were languages which were parallel to Sanskrit, not originated from Sanskrit, we do not know where they originated, but they were parallel to Sanskrit, but they did not have the status of Sanskrit, but they soon got it. So, the languages um, Prakriti and Sanskriti as you see, you can see that. Then we start with the historical, we, we, we saw the pre uh, proto historical constructed uh, historical period. The historical periods where we have documented evidence is Jainism to emerge 500 to 300 BC, 566 to 486 is Buddhism BC. Then 327 to 325 BC is the uh, invasion by Alexander, King Alexander from Greece, he came here and conquered parts of India. Then we have 322 to 185 or 183, the Maurya Empire, the clan of Ma Mauryas, 185 BC to 300 AD is again an age of invasion and AD 300 to 600 is the pinnacle of Indian prosperity in ancient India, 300 to 600 AD. So, Natya Shastra is the first treatise is to be placed somewhere 200 before Christ to 200 after Christ, 200 BC to 200 AD somewhere 
at this these two points okay then you have uh, 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 the rule of the uh, uh, the the muslim conquerors the mughal empire from 1500 to 1700 and uh, then you have the british rule you have the post british rule after 1947 the modern india emerges it emerges in the 19th century basically but the british rule ended in 1947 and we became independent to take our own decisions and to implement what we had acquired from modernity from the british in terms of education in terms of law in terms of constitution in terms of and whatever elements of our own ancient culture and medieval culture which we wanted to retain we were free to do that some of the things have been had been abolished by the british for example the the sati uh, practice the practice that a woman uh, will sacrifice herself after her husband's death it made no sense in the modern world okay so widows and then the whole life of widows was terrible in the 19th century all over india it was terrible even if today some people who believe in that kind of ideology they make life of the widows miserable absolutely miserable so the british introduced some of the uh, some of the reforms as they call it there was also a debate play uh, played out and it had immense impact on cultural dimension of india and the arts of india the debate about should political independence from the british be prioritized or should we prioritize inner social reforms should India get modernized first and then become independent or should India become independent and then choose to modernize itself or not to modernize it, something like that. The choice is ours after we get political, political independence, there is no interference from the British. So there was a debate between uh, say two thinkers from Maharashtra, Tilak and Agar. Tilak arguing that Bal Gangadhar Tilak arguing who, who died in 1920 the political leader of Indian Congress arguing that we need political freedom then we can decide what we want to do with ourselves on the other hand Agarkar was saying the moment you get political freedom you are going to forget about social reforms you should implement educational reforms social reforms cultural reforms and move towards a more, more modern life. This will take um, care of itself, political freedom. It will take care of itself. Now, there was a huge debate even at the Indian, uh, pan-Indian level. But the debate was an internal debate and we did get political independence and then decided to implement democracy etc etc the arts were changing at that time in fact by the end of the 19th century the princely states who used to support the artists were declining that patronage royal patronage in india was shifting to popular patronage and the arts changed because of that. There was no longer any gurukul left. The gurus in Indian art left their places and started migrating to urban developing centers like Calcutta, like Bombay. So the arts changed, music changed immensely over the transition from 19th to 20th century even before we became independence after independence of course we have the of course there, there were 
uh, universities which were already established by the British for modern education, but things like IITs and the more modern universities came up after independence. For technological education, for other types of education, liberal education, arts education, so arts and sciences at a higher level were becoming part of the university education. The school education also of course changed considerably over 19th and 20th centuries. The education of art, the pedagogy of music was changing and very soon around 60s and 70s music departments started emerging where they used to teach music in modern schools, not really the Guru Shishya system, but the large classroom systems and you know that music cannot be taught in a classroom. If I want to teach you how to produce your own voice, I can't be addressing a class of 40, 50 people. It has to be one to one. So that teacher taught relationship considerably changed. And then there was a reaction in 70s and 80s that no, no, this system is not working, it will not produce good artists. So we must continue the older system of Guru Shishya, not Guru Kula, that Shishyas are going and staying with the Gurus, but something one to one, not one to many, one teacher to many students, no, that will not work. So something of that kind, dance and music change. Drama was slightly different, drama schools and so on. So patronage changed, pedagogy changed, obviously the performances changed. Changes have always been there. Changes from temple rituals to social rituals had already taken place. Certain secularization had taken place from Vedic getting transformed into Gandharva Sangeet, a more secularized musical tradition emerged around 200 or perhaps a little earlier, 200 BC to 200. The music, dance and drama described in the Natya Shastra is not Vedic, it is post Vedic. There were professional groups which had emerged. This was not for the sacred purpose of yajna, the sacred purpose of propitiation, the sacred purpose of um, you know praying to gods. Some ideology remained there, but it got eliminated slowly and gradually. People were there to present, to perform. Now, yeah, what is the ultimate purpose? Ultimate pr purpose is still the Atman becoming one with Brahman or the Atman expressing itself and so on. So, uh, some philosophical traditions maintain that. Even in art, you do the same. The Advaita of Atma and Paramatma, the Advaita of the Brahman and the Atman. These some strands of that philosophy remained. When things changed, a new description had to be given in terms of musicology and the science of dance and drama, dramaturgy. So that new science had already been formed in ancient India, codified in the Natya Shastra, which is ascribed to Bharata Muni somebody called Bharata Muni. Now this is an ascription because we do not have any details about who this Bharata was. And there was this tradition of ascribing any treatise to a Muni. Now there is an interesting story about this which has been inserted into Natya Shastra later on. It is not the original part of Natya Shastra. Scholars have found this out. 
that uh, Brahmadev he wanted to compose a treatise on how to perform, to give it to everybody, gods, demons, everybody. He asked Indra, the king of gods, to sort of find out if any god has not committed sin, the pure god. And Brahma said, I will give this composition to him, this basic text. And Indra reported that, came back and to, reported that there was no God who has not committed a sin. So, Brahmadeva said, then it is better to give to, to some Muni. So, he called Bharata and it was handed down to Bharata. This is a myth, the origins of Natya Shastra. What has happened is the society and the scholars in it composed it, but there is a tradition of ascribing it to some Muni or some single author that has been a tradition. Mahabharat, who wrote it? Vyasa Muni. Ramayan, who wrote it? Valmiki, who became some kind of, uh, uh, not exactly a Muni, but some kind of a sacred figure. Now, these are ascriptions. We have no knowledge of who these people are. Most probably, it was a collective kind of authorship and also an ascription to God, things fall from heaven and so on. Today, scholars will say, yes, this is an ascription. Human societies have certain ways of looking at their sacred texts and non-sacred texts. And Indians do make a distinction between the sacred texts, a paurusheya, not composed by human beings, and paurusheya, composed by human beings. Now, a paurusheya are also composed by human beings, but are categories, categorized as a Purusheya. They are all social products, they are all human products. Treatises do not fall from heaven. Neither Bible, nor Quran, nor the Vedas, they do not fall from heaven. They are composed by human beings to satisfy certain needs of the time and propagate certain values, which they think are very important. So, Natya Shastra was a codification of some of the prevalent contemporary practices in the performing arts. The Shastra of Natya, Natya Shastra, the theory. Shastra is definitely Dharma Shastra, Niti Shastra, Saundarya Shastra, Natya Shastra. Kavya Shastra. Shastra is a codification, a rational thinking, classification, theory and so on. All that comes under Shastra. Systematization of contemporary knowledge and some prescriptive codification. How art should be performed, how instruments should be made. This is a reflection of how they were actually made at that time. Please remember that, contemporary practices, how people performed and so on. So, this is a kind of um, historical perspective that we are taking on art. We will keep switching over between the medium of music and the historical changes that are, this will keep on, we will keep moving like that, right. So, we will now uh, have some session of uh, question answer, but thank you for this session.